Imagine a world where the political landscape is ruthless, where deceit and cunning are as potent as brute force. In this world, one man emerges as a pivotal figure, defying expectations and revealing the secrets of power, Niccolò Machiavelli. In The Prince, Machiavelli takes us on a compelling journey into the depths of the human soul and the intricacies of governance. With sharp prose and a unique vision, he immerses us in a realm of intrigue, betrayal, and relentless ambition. What makes a leader truly effective? How is power maintained in a world teeming with enemies? And to what lengths will a prince go to secure his throne? Guided by Machiavelli's The Prince, we will explore timeless truths about power and human nature. Are you ready to challenge your perceptions and delve into the essence of leadership? Join us as we navigate the captivating world of The Prince. Chapter 1 of the different types of principalities and of the manner in which all states, all dominions, that have held and hold sway over men have been and are either republics or principalities. Principalities are either hereditary, when the family of the prince has ruled over them for a long time, or they are new. The new ones are either entirely new, as Milan was to Francesco Sforza, or they are like members annexed to the hereditary state of the prince who acquires them, as the kingdom of Naples is to the king of Spain. Such dominions thus acquired are either accustomed to living under a prince or to being free, and they are acquired either by the arms of the prince himself or of others, by fortune or by virtue. Chapter 2. Of Hereditary Principalities I will leave out all discussion on republics, having already treated of them at length elsewhere, I will address only principalities, weaving together my opinions on how such principalities can be governed and preserved. In the first place, it is easier to maintain a hereditary state accustomed to a prince's family than a new principality because it suffices not to disturb the order established by its princes, and then to adapt oneself to any emergencies that may arise. Thus a hereditary prince has less cause and less necessity to offend, whence it happens that he is more loved and unless extraordinary vices cause him to be hated, it is reasonable to suppose that his subjects will be naturally well disposed towards him. In the antiquity and continuity of the rule, the memory and motives for innovations are eliminated, because one change always leaves a dentition for building up another. Chapter 3. Of Mixed Principalities But the difficulties are in a new principality, and they even exist in a mixed principality, which is not entirely new but rather an addition to an old established state and which can be termed a composite state. The difficulties in such a state arise firstly from a natural difficulty which exists in all new principalities because men change their rulers willingly, hoping to better themselves, and this belief makes them take up arms against their ruler in which they are deceived because they afterwards find by experience that they have gone from bad to worse. This follows on another natural and common necessity, which compels a new prince always to offend his new subjects, both with his soldiers and with many other injuries which he must inflict upon them in connection with his new acquisition. Thus, you have enemies in all those whom you have injured in seizing that principality, and you are unable to keep those friends who put you there, because you cannot satisfy them in the way they expected, and you cannot take strong measures against them, feeling bound to them. For however strong your armies may be, you will always need the favour of the inhabitants to take possession of a province. However, by residing elsewhere one realises when problems have already become serious and can no longer be remedied. Additionally, the prince's representatives cannot plunder the province, and the subjects are more satisfied because they can easily appeal to him. They have more opportunities to love him if they wish to be good and to fear him if they wish to act otherwise. Foreigners who might wish to seize the state would respect it more, making it very difficult to lose if they reside there. Another good solution is to send colonies to one or two places that serve as keys to this state, because it is necessary to do so or maintain numerous troops in the colonies. This does not cost much and with minimal expenses they are governed and preserved. Only those from whom fields and houses are taken to give to the new inhabitants who form a small part of this state are harmed. Since the harmed are poor and dispersed, they can never represent a danger, and for the others, 
as they have no reason to feel aggrieved, and, on the other hand, fear to act wrongly and risk what happened to the dispossessed, they remain quiet. Thus he concluded that colonies are inexpensive, more loyal, and less risky, and that the harmed cannot cause problems because they are poor and isolated, as I have already said. It should be noted that men must be either won over or eliminated, for they avenge themselves for slight offences, but cannot do so for grave ones. Thus, the offence done to a man should be such that he cannot avenge it. If, instead of colonies, military occupation is employed, the expenses are much greater because maintaining the guard absorbs the state's revenues and the acquisition turns into a loss. Additionally, everyone is harmed and inconvenienced by the frequent change of the soldiers' lodgings, a discomfort and harm that everyone suffers, and for which all become enemies. These enemies are to be feared even if they remain locked in their homes. Therefore, military occupation is, from all points of view, as useless as colonies are useful. The prince who annexes a province with customs, language and organization, different from his own, must also become the champion and defender of the less powerful neighbors, manage to weaken the more powerful ones, and ensure that no foreigner as powerful as himself enters his state under any pretext. For it always happens that the new arrival takes sides with those who, out of ambition or fear, are discontented with his government, as has already been seen when the Aetolians called the Romans into Greece the invaders entered other provinces at the invitation of their own inhabitants. What commonly happens is that a powerful foreigner does not enter a province, and all those who envy the stronger among them join him, so the foreigner does not need much effort to rally them to his cause, for they immediately and willingly form a block with the invading state. He only needs to ensure that his allies do not gain too much strength and authority afterward, which he can easily do with his troops, who will crush the powerful, and leave him the sole arbiter of the province. Anyone who does not govern well in this regard will quickly lose what he has conquered, and even if he retains it, he will encounter countless difficulties and obstacles. The Romans, in the provinces where they became masters perfectly, observed these rules. They established colonies, respected the less powerful without increasing their power, subdued the powerful, and did not allow powerful foreigners to gain influence in the country. Let what happened in the province of Greece serve as an example. The Laconians and the Aetolians were respected, the kingdom of the Macedonians was subdued, Antiochus was driven out, and neither the merits of the Laconians nor the Aetolians allowed them to expand. Nor did Philip's promises lead them to consider him a friend without subduing him. Nor did Antiochus's power enable them to give him any state in the province. The Romans acted on these occasions as any prudent prince should do which is not only to worry about present disorders, but also about future ones, and to avoid them at all costs. By preventing them in time, they can be easily remedied, but if one waits until they grow, the remedy comes too late, for the disease has become incurable. This is what doctors of the body say. At first, the disease is difficult to recognize, but easy to cure, while over time, if it has not been recognized or treated, it becomes easy to recognize, but difficult to cure. The same goes for the affairs of the state. The evils that arise in it, when recognized in time, can be quickly cured, but if they are not recognized and allowed to grow, they can no longer be cured, and everyone sees them. But since the Romans saw the inconveniences in time, they always remedied them and never let them take their course to avoid a war, because they knew that a war was not avoided, but only deferred to the advantage of others. They declared war on Philip and Antiochus in Greece, not to be obliged to sustain it in Italy, and although they could have avoided it at the time in both cases, they never followed the advice that is on the lips of all the wise men of our time. One must wait for time to bring everything. They preferred to rely on their prudence and valour, knowing that time can bring all kinds of things, both good and bad and both bad and good. But let us return to France and examine if anything that has been said has been done, I will not speak of Charles, but of Louis, that is, of the one who, having dominated longer in Italy, allowed us to appreciate his conduct more. We will see how he did the opposite of what must be done to preserve a state of different nationality. King Louis was brought to Italy by the ambition of the Venetians, who wanted to conquer half of Lombardy with his intervention. I do not claim to criticize the decision made by the king, 
for if he intended to begin introducing himself into Italy and was devoid of friends, and all doors were closed to him due to the misdeeds of King Charles, he could only accept the friendships offered to him. He would have succeeded in his design if he had not made any errors in his subsequent measures. Once Lombardy was conquered, the king quickly restored to France the reputation that Charles had lost. Genoa submitted, the Florentines offered him their friendship, the Marquis of Mantua, the Duke of Ferrara, the Lady of Forlì, the Lords of Faenza, Pesaro, Rimini, Camerino, and Piombino, the Lucchese, the Pisans, and the Sienese all tried to become his friends. The Venetians then realized the folly of their idea to seize two cities in Lombardy, for the king had become the owner of two-thirds of Italy. Consider now with what ease the king could have maintained his influence in Italy if he had observed the rules mentioned and defended his friends, who, being numerous and weak, always needed his support, some against the Venetians and others against the church. But he quickly acted to the contrary in Milan by aiding Pope Alexander to occupy Romagna. He did not realize that by taking this measure he was losing his friends and those who had placed themselves under his protection. At the same time, he weakened his own forces and enlarged the church by adding so much temporal power to spiritual power, which already had sufficient authority. Having committed a first error, he had to continue on the same path, and to curb Alexander's ambition and prevent him from becoming the Lord of Tuscany, he was compelled to return to Italy. It was not enough for him to have enlarged the church and lost his friends, but to enjoy the kingdom of Naples peacefully, he shared it with the king of Spain. Where he was once the sole arbiter, he brought in a partner, so that the ambitious and discontented in the province had someone to turn to. And where he could have left a tributary king, he called in someone who could have driven him out. The greed for conquest is undoubtedly a very natural and common sentiment, and whenever those who can do it will be more praised than blamed. But when they try to do it at any cost, those who cannot do it are justifiably blamed. If France could, with its forces, seize Naples, it should have done so, and if it could not, it should not have divided it. If the division of Lombardy with the Venetians was excusable because it allowed him to enter Italy, the other act, which was not justified by any necessity, is blameworthy. Thus, Louis committed five errors. He destroyed the weak, increased the power of a powerful one in Italy, introduced a foreigner even more powerful, did not establish himself in the territory he conquered, and did not found colonies. Yet these errors, at least in his lifetime, might not have had disastrous consequences if he had not committed the sixth, stripping the Venetians of their state. For instead of strengthening the church and bringing Spain into Italy, it would have been very reasonable and even necessary to subdue it. But having committed this error, he should never have consented to the ruin of the Venetians because, powerful as they were, they would have always kept others at a distance from any action against Lombardy, either because they would not have allowed it to be the sole proprietors, or because others would not have wanted to take it from France to give it to the Venetians, and to attack both at the same time would have lacked the audacity. And if someone said that King Louis gave Romagna to Alexander and Naples to Spain to avoid a war, I would reply with the reasons mentioned above, that to avoid war, one should never let a disorder follow its course, for it is not avoided, but only deferred to one's own detriment. And if others argued that the king had promised the Pope to carry out the enterprise in his favour, to obtain the dissolution of his marriage and the hat of Rouen, I would reply with what will be said later about the faith of princes, and how to observe it. King Louis thus lost Lombardy for not following any of the rules observed by those who conquered provinces and wished to retain them. It is not a miracle, but a very natural and logical fact, as I said before to the Cardinal of Rouen. While the Valentinois, as the people called Cesare Borgia, son of Pope Alexander, occupied Romagna, as the Cardinal of Rouen told me that the Italians understood nothing about the matters of war, I had to reply that the French understood even less about matters of state, for otherwise they would not have allowed the Church to gain so much influence, and it was seen how, after contributing to the greatness of the Church and Spain in Italy, France was ruined by them. From this comes a general rule that never fails, or rarely, he who helps another become powerful causes his own ruin 
because it is natural for one who has become powerful to be suspicious of the same stratagems or the same force through which he was aided. As for the kingdom of Darius, occupied by Alexander, it did not rebel against his successors after his death, considering the difficulties of preserving a newly acquired state. Someone might wonder with astonishment why Alexander the Great, having become master of Asia in a few years and barely dead, his successors, in circumstances where it would have been very natural for the state to revolt, retained it in their hands with no other obstacles than those that arose from ambition among themselves. I reply that all principalities of which we have any record have been governed in two different ways, either by a prince who selects his servants, who are all ministers that help him govern, or by a prince assisted by nobles who owe their position not to the favour of the ruler but to the antiquity of their lineage. These nobles possess estates and subjects who recognize them as lords and are naturally attached to them. In states governed by a prince assisted by servants, the prince enjoys greater authority because in the whole province no one is recognized as sovereign except him. If one obeys another, it is only because he is a minister and magistrate of the prince without any special affection for him. Examples of these two types of government can be found today in the Grand Turk and the King of France. All of Turkey is governed by a single lord, and the inhabitants are his servants. The lord divides his kingdom into sanjaks, appoints administrators, and changes them at his discretion. Conversely, the King of France is surrounded by numerous ancient nobles who have their privileges, who are recognized and loved by their subjects, and who possess estates that the kingdom cannot easily take away. If one examines these two types of government, one will see that there is indeed a difficulty in conquering the state of the Turk. But once conquered, it is very easy to keep. The reasons for the difficulty in seizing the kingdom of the Turk lie in the fact that one cannot expect to be called by the princes of the state, nor count on their rebellion to facilitate the enterprise. Since they are slaves and debtors of the prince, it is not easy to corrupt them, and even if one succeeds, it would be of little use. For the reasons mentioned, traitors could not lead the people with them. Therefore, anyone considering attacking the Turk must first consider that they will find the state united and must rely more on their own forces than on the intrigues of others. But once vanquished and beaten in battle in such a way that he cannot reconstitute his armies, it only remains to take the prince's family. Once this is extinguished, there is no one left to fear, for no one has credit with the people. Before the victory, the conqueror could expect nothing from the prince's ministers, but afterward the opposite is true. With kingdoms organized like that of France, where if you attract some of the nobles who are always dissatisfied and friends of change, it will be easy to bring them to open the way for your conquest. However, if you want to maintain it, you will subsequently encounter countless difficulties and have to fight against those who helped you and those you oppressed. It will not be enough to exterminate the prince's family. There will remain the nobles who will become the leaders of new movements. Since you cannot satisfy them all, nor kill them all, you will lose the state at the first opportunity. Now if one reflects on the nature of Darius's government, one will see that it was very similar to that of the Turk. Therefore, Alexander had to confront him and overthrow him in pitched battle. After the victory and the death of Darius, Alexander became the peaceful master of the state, for the reasons stated. If his successors had remained united, they could have enjoyed the conquest in peace, for there were no other tumults in the kingdom, except those they themselves stirred up. But it is impossible to enjoy such a degree of security in a state organized like France, for example. The numerous principalities that existed in Spain, Italy and Greece explain the frequent revolts against the Romans. As long as the memory of their existence lasted, the Romans were never sure of their conquest. But once this memory faded, thanks to the duration and power of their empire, they became the secure masters of these provinces. And thus later, quarrelling among themselves, they could take as much from it as was possible for them. For the family of their former lords being extinct, they recognized no other masters than the Romans. Considering these things, no one will be surprised by the ease with which Alexander maintained the empire of Asia and the difficulty with which others preserved what they had acquired, like Pyrrhus and many others. This does not depend on the conqueror's small or great virtue, but on the nature of what is conquered. 
the Spartans and the Romans serve as examples. The Spartans occupied Athens and Thebes, leaving an oligarchic government in both cities, yet they lost them. The Romans, to preserve Capua, Carthage and Numantia, raised them and did not lose them. They wanted to keep Greece as the Spartans had, by leaving it its laws and liberty, but they did not succeed. Therefore they were obliged to destroy many cities in this province to avoid losing it. The only sure way to dominate a city accustomed to living free is to destroy it. Anyone who becomes the owner of such a city and does not crush it, waits to be crushed by it. Their rebellions will always have as a rallying cry the name of liberty and their ancient institutions, the habit of which they can never lose, as well as the advantages it confers, regardless of precautions taken. If the inhabitants do not separate or disperse, no one forgets this name or these institutions, and they immediately resort to them in times of need, as Pisa did after being a century under the Florentine yoke. However, when cities or provinces are accustomed to living under a prince, and the extinction of him and his lineage leaves the government vacant, since the inhabitants are used to obeying and have no one to obey, they fail to agree on choosing one among themselves, nor can they live in liberty. Finally, since they do not decide to take up arms against the invader, a prince can easily conquer and retain them. In republics, on the other hand, there is more life, more hatred, more desire for vengeance. The memory of their ancient liberty does not allow them a single moment of rest. Therefore, the best path is to destroy them or to take root there. In Chapter 6 of The New Principalities Acquired with One's Own Arms and Personal Talent, let no one be surprised that, when discussing newly created principalities and those where only the prince is new, I mention illustrious examples. Men almost always follow the path opened by others and strive to imitate the actions of others. Although it is not possible to follow exactly the same path or reach the perfection of the model, any prudent man should engage on the path followed by the great and imitate those who have been excellent, so that if they do not equal them in virtue, at least they approach it. They should act like experienced archers who, when they must hit a distant target, and knowing the range of their weapon aim above it, not to reach such a height, but to succeed in hitting the target with the help of such an elevated aim. The newly created principalities, where there is a new prince, are more or less difficult to maintain, depending on the ability of the prince who acquires them. Given that becoming a prince from nothing necessarily requires talent or luck, it can be believed that either of these two factors involves many difficulties. However, the one who has relied least on luck is always the one who has maintained his conquest the longest. It also greatly facilitates things that not possessing other states, a prince is obliged to establish himself in the one he has acquired. But I want to speak of those who did not become princes by chance, but by their virtues. Among them, the most illustrious have been Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, Theseus, and others not less great. And even if Moses was merely an instrument of God's will, he still deserves admiration, if only for the grace that made him worthy to speak to God. Cyrus and all the others who acquired or founded kingdoms are equally admirable. If we judge their actions and their government, we will discover that they are no less brilliant than those of Moses, who had such a great teacher. If we study their lives and works, we will find that they did not owe their success to luck, but to having provided the opportune moment, which was the material to which they gave the appropriate form. Indeed, without this opportunity, their merits would have been of no value. But it is also true that without their merits, it would have been useless for the opportunity to present itself. It was necessary for Moses to find the people of Israel enslaved and oppressed by the Egyptians, so that this people, eager to escape their suffering, was prepared to follow him. Romulus needed to be unable to live in Alba and be exposed at birth to become king of Rome and founder of his homeland. Cyrus had to see the Persians discontented with the rule of the Medes and the Medes weak and indolent due to a long peace. Theseus could not have highlighted his virtues if he had not witnessed the dispersion of the Athenians. Thus these opportunities allowed these men to successfully achieve their aims and their merits allowed the opportunities to bear fruit, filling their homelands with glory and happiness. Those who, through paths similar to those of these men, become princes, acquire the principality with difficulty, but maintain it without turmoil.
The difficulties arise partly from the new laws and customs they are obliged to introduce to establish the state and ensure its security. It must be considered that there is nothing more difficult to undertake, more doubtful of success, or more dangerous to manage than to introduce new laws. The innovator becomes the enemy of all those who benefited from the old laws, and he gains only lukewarm support from those who will benefit from the new ones. These lukewarm responses are caused partly by the fear of those who have the old legislation on their side, and partly by the incredulity of men who never believe in new things until they see the results. Thus, whenever the enemies have the opportunity to attack, they do so energetically, while the others defend tepidly, risking downfall along with them. Therefore, if we analyse this part well, we must see if these innovators rely on themselves or depend on others that is, if they need to resort to pleading to carry out their work, or if they can impose it by force. In the first case they always fail, and nothing of their intentions remains, but when they rely solely on themselves and can act with the help of force, they rarely fail to achieve their objectives. That is why all armed prophets have triumphed and all unarmed ones have failed. It should also be noted that people are fickle, and while it is easy to convince them of something, it is difficult to keep them convinced. Therefore, it is advisable to be prepared in such a way that when they no longer believe, one can make them believe by force. Moses, Cyrus, Theseus and Romulus would not have been able to maintain their statutes for long if they had been unarmed, as happened with our own frights. Girolamo Savonarola failed in his innovations as soon as people stopped believing in them, for he found himself without means to keep believers faithful to their beliefs or to make the disbelievers believe. It must be acknowledged that these innovators encounter serious difficulties, that all dangers arise on their path, and that only with great courage can they overcome them. But once the obstacles are overcome, and once they have eliminated those who envied their virtues, they live powerful, secure, honoured and happy. We should add another example of lesser importance, but which maintains a certain proportion with the others, and serves to illustrate those in the same class, that of Hero of Syracuse, who, a mere citizen, became prince without owing anything to luck except the opportunity. The oppressed Syracusans appointed him their captain, and he then earned enough merit to be elected prince. Despite his lack of nobility, he showed such virtues that the one who wrote about him said that he dismissed the old army and created a new one, abandoned his old friendships, and formed new ones. Thus, surrounded by loyal soldiers and friends, he could build whatever edifice he wanted on such foundations, and what cost him so much to acquire, cost him little to maintain. Chapter 7. On New Principalities Acquired by the arms and fortune of others, those who become princes solely by luck need little effort to become so, but they maintain their position with great difficulty. Obstacles do not arise on their path, because these men are quick, but they appear once they are established. I refer to those who buy a state or who obtain it as a gift, as happened to many in Greece, in the cities of Ionia and Hellespont, where they were made princes by Darius, to hold these cities for his security and glory. This also happened to many emperors, who gained the throne by corrupting the soldiers. These princes rely solely on the will and fortune of those who elevated them, both changeable and uncertain and they neither know nor can maintain their position. They do not know how because if they are not men of great talent and superior virtues, it is not presumable that they know the art of command, having always lived as simple citizens. They cannot do so because they lack forces that could be loyal and devoted to them. On the other hand, states that arise suddenly, like all things in nature that grow and flourish prematurely, cannot have roots or supports to defend them against adverse times, unless those who become princes so suddenly rise to the occasion and know immediately how to prepare to maintain it, laying the foundations that others lay before becoming princes. Concerning these two ways of becoming a prince, by merit or by luck, I want to cite two examples that remain in our memory, that of Francesco Sforza and that of Cesare Borgia. Francesco, through appropriate means and great talent, became Duke of Milan from nothing and maintained with little effort what he had conquered with great difficulty on the battlefield. Cesare Borgia, called Valentino by the Vulgar, acquired his state through the fortune of his father and lost it with that same fortune. 
despite having employed all imaginable means, and having done everything a prudent and capable man should do to establish himself in a state obtained with the arms and support of others. As I have already said, he who does not lay the foundations in advance could do so afterward, if he has talent, even at the risk of displeasing the architect and endangering the building. If one examines the progress of the Duke, it will be seen that he had already laid the foundations of his future greatness, and I do not think it is superfluous to talk about them, for I cannot give better advice to a new prince than the example of the measures taken by him. If this did not achieve the expected results, it was not his fault but the product of an extraordinarily severe fortune. He decided to no longer rely on fortune and the arms of others. The first thing he did was to weaken the Orsini and Colonna families in Rome by winning over all the nobles who were loyal to them, granting them generous salaries and honouring them according to their merits by giving them command and administrative positions. In a few months the affection they had for the Orsini and Colonna turned entirely towards the Duke. Then, once the Colonna were dispersed, he awaited the opportunity to finish off the Orsini, a chance that soon presented itself, and he seized it. The Orsini, who realised too late that the Duke's and the Church's growing power would lead to their ruin, held a meeting in the territory of Perugia, which sparked Ervino's rebellion, the turmoil in Romagna, and the numerous dangers faced by the Duke. But he was able to thwart all of this with the help of the French, and once his authority was restored, the Duke, who could neither rely on the French nor other foreign forces, nor dared to defy them, resorted to cunning and concealed his intentions. The Orsini, through Monsieur Paolo, to whom the Duke had extended favours to win him over, not sparing money, clothes or horses, were so reconciled that their candour led them to fall into his hands at Sinigaglia. Once these leaders were exterminated and their followers turned into his friends, the Duke had built solid foundations for his future power, especially since he possessed all of Romagna and the Duchy of Ervino, and had gained the goodwill of these people who began to appreciate the benefits of his government. And because this part deserves to be mentioned and imitated by others, it should not be overlooked. When the Duke found Romagna under the command of inept lords who plundered their subjects instead of governing them, giving them more reasons for disunity than unity, leading to constant thefts, quarrels and all kinds of disorders, he deemed it necessary, if he wanted to pacify and bring the people under the prince's control, to establish a strict government. He chose for this task Ramiro de Orco, a cruel and expedient man to whom he gave full authority. In a short time, Orco imposed his authority, restoring peace and unity. Then, the Duke deemed this excessive and necessary authority, which could have been hated, and created a civil tribunal in the centre of the province, presided over by a very virtuous man, where every citizen had their lawyer. And knowing that past rigours had engendered some animosity towards him, he wanted to show, to appease his subjects' anger and win them over, that if any cruelty had been committed, it was not his fault, but that of his harsh minister. So, one morning, he had Orco displayed in the piazza of Cesenate, cut in two pieces with a bloody knife beside him. The ferocity of such a spectacle left the people both satisfied and astounded. But let's return to the main point. The Duke found himself sufficiently powerful and partially shielded from immediate danger, having armed himself as necessary and eliminated the armies posing immediate threats. But he lacked if he wanted to continue his conquests, securing the respect of the King of France, as this King, although late in recognising his error, would attempt to correct it. He thus began to forge new friendships and to be indecisive with the French. When they headed to the Kingdom of Naples to fight the Spaniards besieging Gaeta, and if Alexander had still intended to rid himself of them, it would have been realised. This was his conduct regarding current events. Concerning the future, he mainly needed to avoid that the new successor to the papal throne would be his enemy and strip away what Alexander had given him. He planned to achieve this through four different means. First, by exterminating all the descendants of the lords he had dispossessed, so the Pope would not have the chance to reinstate them. Second, by winning over all the nobles of Rome to oppose the Pope's plans with their help. Third, by reducing the college to his will as much as possible. Fourth, 
by acquiring as much power as possible before the Pope died to be able to resist a first attack on his own. He had already accomplished three of these four things. At Alexander's death, the fourth was achieved for he had killed as many dispossessed lords as he could and very few survived. He relied on the Roman nobles won to his cause and enjoyed significant influence in the college. Regarding new conquests, he aimed to seize Tuscany, for he already possessed Perugia and Piombino, in addition to Pisa, under his protection. Once he no longer had to appease the French, as they had already been stripped of the kingdom by the Spaniards and both needed his friendship, he would turn to Pisa. Then Luca and Siena would soon fall, first out of hatred for the Florentines, and then out of fear of the Duke. The Florentines could do nothing if he succeeded in this. Even in the year of Alexander's death, he would have acquired so much power and authority that he could have supported himself independently, relying not on fortune or foreign forces, but on his power and merits. But Alexander died five years after his son had started to wield the sword, leaving him only a consolidated state in Romagna and all other territories in suspense between two powerful enemy armies and himself dying. Yet the Duke had such vigor of soul and body and knew so well how to win and lose men that the foundations he had laid in so little time were so solid that with just a bit of luck or merely good health he could have withstood all difficulties. And if the foundations of his power were solid or not, it would soon be seen, for Romagna waited for him more than a month, and although he was half dead, nothing was attempted against him. Though the Baglioni, the Vitelli and the Orsini went there with that purpose, and if he did not make the Pope he wanted, at least he succeeded in preventing the one he did not want from becoming Pope. But everything would have been easy for him if he had not been ill at Alexander's death. He himself told me the day Julius II was elected that he had foreseen everything that could happen at his father's death and had prepared remedies for all, but he never thought that he would be near death in such circumstances. Therefore I cannot blame any of the Duke's actions. On the contrary, it seems to me that all those who come to power through fortune and foreign arms should imitate them, for it is impossible to behave otherwise when one has so much courage and ambition. And if his plans were not realized, it was only due to his illness and Alexander's short life. The new prince, who finds it necessary to defend against enemies, conquer friends, win by force or fraud, be loved or feared by the people, be respected and obeyed by the soldiers, eliminate those who can harm him, replace old laws with new ones, be both severe and amiable, magnanimous and generous, dissolve unfaithful militias, create new ones, maintain the friendship of kings and princes so that they willingly favor or fear him with suspicion. Whoever finds it indispensable to do all this, I say, can find no more recent examples than the acts of the Duke. He can only be criticized for his choice of the new Pope, for even if he could not ensure the election of a Pope of his liking, he could have prevented this or that Cardinal from becoming Pope, and he should never have allowed a Cardinal offended by him to be elevated to the pontificate, because men offend out of fear or hatred. Those he had offended included, among others, the Cardinal of San Pietro in Vincoli, the Colonna, San Giorgio and Ascanio. All others, if they had achieved solidity, should have feared him, except for the Cardinal de Gusa, due to his power which came from the alliance and reciprocal obligations of France and Spain. Therefore the Duke should have first tried to have a Spanish Pope elected, and if he could not secure the Cardinal de Gusa, he should have at least opposed the Cardinal of San Pietro in Vincoli. For anyone who believes that new benefits make people forget old offences is mistaken. The Duke made a mistake in this choice, the ultimate cause of his final ruin. Chapter 8. Concerning those who have become princes by crimes. But as there are two other ways to become a prince that cannot be attributed entirely to fortune or virtue, it is appropriate not to ignore them. Although this is discussed in more detail in the context of republics, I first refer to the case where one becomes a prince through a path of wickedness and crimes, and then to the case where one becomes a prince by the favor of fellow citizens. With two examples, one ancient and one contemporary, I will illustrate the first of these methods without delving too deeply into the matter, for I think it is sufficient for those in need to imitate them. Agathocles the Sicilian, a man not only of obscure but low and abject condition, 
became king of Syracuse, the son of a potter. He led a reprehensible life at every stage. However, he always accompanied his misdeeds with as much courage and physical vigor. Entering the army, he climbed the ranks one by one, eventually becoming praetor. Once elevated to this dignity, he wanted to become prince and obtain by violence, without owing anything to anyone, what would have been willingly granted to him. He allied with the Carthaginian Hamilcar, who was with his armies in Sicily, and one morning he gathered the people and the Senate as if to deliberate on matters related to the Republic. At an agreed signal, his soldiers killed all the senators and the richest citizens of Syracuse. He then occupied the city and knew how to maintain it as a prince without causing a civil war. And although the Carthaginians besieged him twice and ultimately defeated him, not only was he able to defend the city, but by leaving part of his troops to contain the besiegers, he invaded Africa and quickly lifted the siege of Syracuse. He put the Carthaginians in such a situation that they were forced to negotiate with him, be content with possessions in Africa, and leave Sicily to him. Whoever studies the actions of Agathocles and judges his merits will find very little or nothing that can be attributed to luck. He did not acquire sovereignty through anyone's favour, as I mentioned earlier, but through military ranks he had earned at the cost of many sacrifices and dangers, and he remained in power thanks to his energetic and bold measures. Indeed, one cannot call virtue the act of killing fellow citizens, betraying friends, and lacking faith, piety, and religion. By these means, one can acquire power but not glory. But if one examines Agathocles' courage in facing and overcoming dangers, and his greatness of soul in enduring and overcoming adverse events, one does not understand why he should be considered inferior to the most famous captains. However, his inhumanity, cruelties, and countless misdeeds do not allow him to be placed among illustrious men. Therefore, what he achieved cannot be attributed to fortune or virtue without the aid of either. In our time, under Pope Alexander VI, Cesare Borgia, although orphaned and sick from an early age, was educated by one of his maternal uncles named Juan Fogliani. In his early youth, he was entrusted to Paolo Vitelli and to attain a high rank in the armies through his teachings. Upon Paolo's death, he served under his brother Vitelloso, and being intelligent and having a robust mind and body, he quickly became the foremost man in his army. But since he deemed it unworthy to serve others, he wanted to seize Fermo, with the consent of Vitelloso and the help of certain inhabitants of the city, for whom servitude was more dear than the liberty of their homeland. He wrote to his uncle Juan, telling him that after so many years of absence, he wished to see his homeland and him again, and partly also to know the state of his patrimony, and that since he had only laboured to gain glory, he wanted to show his compatriots that he had not wasted his time, to enter with all honours accompanied by one hundred knights, friends and servants, he implored him. Since the citizens of Fermo would honourably welcome him, not only would they honour Cesare Borgia, but they would honour themselves for he had been their tutor. Juan forgot none of the honours due to his nephew and had him received with dignity by the citizens of Fermo, with whom he stayed for a few days, having prepared everything necessary for his premeditated crime. He then organised a solemn banquet to which he invited Juan Fogliani and the principal men of Fermo. After consuming the dishes and concluding the usual entertainments on such occasions, Orsini deliberately steered the conversation to raise dangerous arguments about the greatness and actions of Pope Alexander and his son Cesare. When Juan and the others responded to these arguments, he suddenly stood up, saying it was appropriate to discuss these matters in a safer place, and withdrew to a room where Juan and the other citizens followed him. They had not yet taken their seats when soldiers emerged from hidden places and killed Juan and all the others. Once the crime was accomplished, Orsini mounted his horse, traversed the city, and besieged the palace of the Supreme Magistrate. The citizens then had no choice but to submit and form a government from which Orsini freed himself completely. He appointed himself leader, and after eliminating all those who could have posed a danger to him, he strove to strengthen his power with new civil and military laws. During the year he governed, he was not only safe, but instilled fear among all his neighbours, and he would have been as difficult to overthrow as Agathocles if he had not been deceived by Cesare Borgia 
and captured with the Orsini and the Vitelli in Gaul, where a year after his parricide he was strangled in the company of Vitello, his master in exploits and crimes. One might wonder why men like Agathocles and others of his ilk, despite their betrayals and many cruelties, could live long and safely in their homeland without fearing conspiracies, while also defending against external enemies, whereas others, on the contrary, not only failed to maintain their state in uncertain times of war, but also failed in times of peace. I think this depends on the appropriate or inappropriate use of cruelty. Cruelties are well employed if the evil can be called good when it is applied only once out of absolute necessity to secure oneself and is not insisted upon, but on the contrary, the initial acts become as beneficial as possible to the subjects. Cruelties are poorly employed if, although minor at first, they increase over time instead of diminishing. Those who follow the first of these procedures, like Agathocles with the help of God and men, can remedy their situation. The others are unable to maintain their states, from which it follows that when taking a state, any usurper must consider the crimes he needs to commit and execute them all at once, so as not to have to renew them daily. And not being compelled by necessity, he can conquer men by the force of benefits. Whoever acts otherwise, out of timidity or poor counsel, is always obliged to brandish the knife, and cannot rely on subjects whose continual and still recent offences cause mistrust, for offences must be inflicted all at once to last less and do less harm, while benefits must be distributed gradually to be better savoured. And above all, a prince should live with his subjects in such a way that no favourable or adverse event can make him deviate, for the necessity that arises in difficult times and has not been foreseen cannot be remedied, and the good you do now is of no use and no one acknowledges it, for it is considered done by force. Chapter 9 of the Civil Principality addresses the second case, where a citizen, not through crimes or violence, but thanks to the favour of his fellow citizens, becomes prince. The state thus constituted can be called a civil principality. His accession does not depend entirely on merit or luck, rather it relies on a certain skill favoured by fortune and requiring the support of the people or the nobles. Indeed, in every city, these two opposing forces are found. One seeks to govern and oppress the other, which refuses to be governed or oppressed. From the confrontation of these two currents arises one of these three effects, the principality, liberty or license. The principality can be established either by the people or by the nobles, depending on which opportunity arises. The nobles, when they find they cannot resist the people, concentrate all authority in one of their own and make him a prince to satisfy their appetites under his protection. The people, in turn, when they realize they cannot face the nobles, cede their authority to one of their own and make him a prince to defend them. However, the one who attains the principality with the help of the nobles has more difficulty maintaining it than the one who has obtained the support of the people, because those around him consider themselves his equals, making it difficult for him to exercise authority over them. Conversely, the one who comes to power through popular favour is the sole authority and has hardly anyone around him who is not inclined to obey him. He cannot satisfy the nobles without harming others, but he can satisfy the people whose intentions are more honest than those of the nobles, the latter seeking to oppress, whereas the people simply do not want to be oppressed. In the end, it is necessary for the prince to always live with the same people, but not with the same nobles, as he can create new ones or dispose of the existing ones, granting or withdrawing authority at his discretion. To better clarify this part concerning the nobles, I say they should be considered in two principal ways. They either unite completely with his fortune, or they do not. Those who unite and are not greedy should be honoured and loved. Those who do not unite should be regarded in two ways. If they act out of cowardice and natural deficiency of spirit, then the prince must particularly make use of those who have good sense, for in prosperity they will honour him, and in adversity they are not to be feared. But when they do not unite only out of calculation and ambition, it means they think more of themselves than of him, and the prince must beware of them and fear them as if they were declared enemies, for they will have the opportunity to contribute to his ruin in adversity. The one who becomes prince through popular favour 
must strive to maintain their affection, which is easy. The people ask only not to be oppressed, but the one who becomes prince through the favor of the nobles and against the people will do well to seek to win them over, which will only be easy if he takes them under his protection. Given that men feel more grateful when they receive good from someone from whom they expected evil, the people submit more willingly to their benefactor than if they had been led to the principality of their own accord. The prince can win over his people in many ways, which I will not mention, as it is impossible to give fixed rules for something that varies so much according to circumstances. I will simply emphasize that a prince needs the friendship of the people, for otherwise he has no recourse in adversity. Nabi's prince of the Spartans resisted the attack of all of Greece and an invincible Roman army, and it sufficed him to secure very few people to defend his homeland and state against them. If, however, he had the people as his enemy, that would not have been enough. My opinion cannot be contested with the worn-out proverb that he who relies on the people builds on sand, because the proverb is only true when it concerns a mere citizen who relies on the people as if the people had a duty to liberate him when enemies or authorities oppress him. Finally, it is necessary for the prince to always live with the same people, but not with the same nobles, as he can create new ones or dispose of those he had, granting or withdrawing authority at his discretion. To better clarify this part concerning the nobles, I say they should be considered in two principal ways. They either unite completely with his fortune, or they do not. Those who unite and are not greedy should be honored and loved. Those who do not unite should be regarded in two ways. If they act out of cowardice and natural deficiency of spirit, then the prince must particularly make use of those who have good sense, for in prosperity they will honor him and in adversity they are not to be feared. But when they do not unite only out of calculation and ambition, it means they think more of themselves than of him, and the prince must beware of them and fear them as if they were declared enemies, for they will have the opportunity to contribute to his ruin in adversity. The one who becomes prince through popular favor must strive to maintain their affection, which is easy. Then they do not fear them just as they do not fear any of the powerful forces around them. The reason is simple. They are equally fortified, so it cannot be thought that the siege would be difficult and prolonged. They have proper walls and moats as much artillery as they need, and they store everything necessary for drinking, eating, and making fire for a year. Moreover, in order to keep the workers from being a burden on the public treasury, they always have a year's worth of work on these fortifications, which are the nerve and life of the city. Finally, they highly value military exercises, which they regulate with an infinite number of ordinances. Therefore, a prince who governs a stronghold and is not hated by the people cannot be attacked. But if he were, the assailant would be forced to withdraw without glory, because the things of this world are so variable that it is impossible for anyone to maintain their armies for a year, besieging a city in vain. To those who ask if the people will have the patience for such a long siege, and if their own interests will not make them forget the prince, I reply that a powerful and courageous prince will always overcome these difficulties, either by giving his subjects hope that the evil will not last long, by inspiring them with terror of the enemy's misdeeds, or by skillfully dealing with those who seem too bold. Furthermore, it is very likely that the enemy will ravage and pillage the region upon arrival when spirits are most heated and disposed to defence, a propitious moment to impose oneself, because after a few days when spirits have calmed down, the damage will have been done, the misfortunes will have been endured, and there will be no remedy. The subjects thus unite more closely with their prince, as if their houses had been burned and their goods devastated while defending their lord, men being naturally inclined to recognize both the benefits they do and those they receive. Therefore, if all this is well considered, it will not be difficult for a wise prince to firmly maintain the morale of his citizens during the siege, as long as they have neither lack of food nor means of defense. Chapter 12. Different Classes of Militias and Mercenary Soldiers After having examined in detail the nature of the principalities I intended to discuss, and having partially indicated the causes of their prosperity or ruin, as well as the means by which many have sought to acquire and maintain them, it remains for me to speak of the forms of attack and defense that may be necessary in each of the states I have mentioned. 
I have previously explained that it is essential for a prince to lay the foundations of his power, otherwise he will inevitably fail. The indispensable foundations for all states, whether new, old or mixed, are good laws and good troops. Since nothing can be accomplished where these latter are lacking, and since good troops cannot exist without good laws, I will set aside the discussion of laws and speak about troops. I say, therefore, that the troops with which a prince defends his state are either his own, mercenaries, auxiliaries, or mixed. Mercenary and auxiliary troops are useless and dangerous, and the prince whose government relies on mercenary soldiers will never be secure or stable, because they are disunited, ambitious, disloyal, bold among friends, but cowardly among enemies, and they have no discipline because they have no fear of God nor loyalty to men. Thus ruin is only deferred as long as the break is postponed, and even during peace they rob their prince as much as enemies do during war, because they have no other love or motivation to go to battle than the pay of the prince which, on the other hand, is not sufficient to make them willing to die for him. They want to be his soldiers as long as the prince does not wage war. But as soon as war comes, they flee or seek leave. It would not be difficult for me to prove this, for the current ruin of Italy has been caused by nothing other than the trust placed for many years in mercenary troops, who initially, and thanks to certain leaders, made progress that earned them a reputation for bravery, but who showed their true worth as soon as they faced foreign armies. Thus, Charles, King of France, took Italy with a piece of chalk, and those who claim that the fault was ours speak the truth, though it was not the sins they imagined but those I have exposed, and as these sins were committed by the princes, the punishment fell upon them. I want to better demonstrate the ineffectiveness of these armies. Mercenary captains are either men of merit or they are not. If they are, one cannot trust them, because they will always aspire to their own greatness, either by trying to subdue their prince or by oppressing others against the prince's intentions, and if they are not, they will certainly lead the prince to ruin. To those who object that any mercenary could do this, I would respond as follows. A prince or a republic must have its own militias. In a principality the prince must lead the militias in person and perform the duties of captain, and in republics a citizen must do so. If the appointed citizen is not suitable he must be replaced, and if he is suitable for the position, he must be subjected to laws. Experience shows that only armed princes and republics can make great progress, and that mercenary arms bring only harm. It is more difficult for a citizen to subdue a republic armed with its own weapons than a republic armed with foreign weapons. Roman Sparta remained free for many centuries because they were armed. The Swiss are very free because they have their own arms. From antiquity, Mercenary troops serve as an example. The Carthaginians were on the verge of being subdued by their mercenary troops after the first war with the Romans, although the Carthaginians had their citizens as commanders. Philip of Macedonia, appointed captain of the Thebans after the death of Epaminondas, took away their liberty after the victory. The Milanese, after the death of Duke Philip, hired Francesco Sforza to fight the Venetians. Sforza defeated the enemy at Caravaggio then turned against his masters, the Milanese, and seized their state. The father of Francesco Sforza, who was in the service of Queen Joan of Naples, abandoned her unexpectedly, and she, finding herself without troops to defend her, was forced, to avoid losing the kingdom, to hand it over to the King of Aragon. And if the Florentines and Venetians expanded their domains with these militias, and their captains defended them rather than subduing them, it is due solely to luck. For among these captains, some never won, others faced opposition, and the rest directed their ambitions elsewhere. Among the first is John Hawkwood, whose loyalty could hardly be known since he never achieved victory, but no one will fail to recognize that if he had triumphed, the Florentines would have been at his mercy. Francesco Sforza always had the Braceschi as opponents, and they kept an eye on each other. Finally, Francesco turned his attention to Lombardy and Braccio to the Church and the Kingdom of Naples. But let us return to recent events. The Florentines appointed Paolo Vitelli as captain of their militias, a very prudent man who, despite his humble condition, had acquired great renown after taking Pisa. If the Florentines had abandoned him, 
they would have had to support him, otherwise they were lost and would have sided with the enemies. And if they had wanted him to stay, they would have had to obey him. If we examine the methods of the Venetians, we see that they acted with prudence and glory as long as they waged war with their own soldiers. This occurred before they ventured onto the mainland, relying then on nobles and commoners, defending their own territory. However, once they started fighting on the mainland, they abandoned this virtue and adopted the customs of the rest of Italy. At the outset of their campaigns on the mainland, they had nothing to fear from their captains, either due to the small size of their state or because of their great reputation. But when their territory expanded under Carmagnola, they realized their mistake. Seeing that this man, whose capability they knew after defeating the Duke of Milan, waged war with such lukewarm enthusiasm, they understood they could no longer expect anything from him as he did not desire it. Unable to dismiss him without losing what they had conquered, they had no choice but to kill him. They then had as captains Bartolome of Bergamo, Roberto of San Severino, the Count of Pitigiano, and others whose victories were not to be feared, but their defeats were as happened later at bay, wherein one day they lost what they had conquered with so much effort over 800 years. For these, mil for these militias bring either slow, belated and petty acquisitions, or sudden and fabulous losses. And as these examples have led me to speak of Italy, let us study the history of the mercenary troops that governed it for so many years. Let us return to ancient times, so that by knowing their origins and progress, errors can be corrected. It should be noted that in recent times, when the emperor began to be driven out of Italy and the temporal power of the pope increased, Italy divided into many states, as many great cities took up arms against their lords, who were formerly favoured by the emperor and kept them subservient. The Pope, to take advantage of this, supported these rebellions as much as he could. Thus Italy almost entirely passed into the hands of the Church and various republics, for some cities had appointed princes from among their citizens, and since these priests and citizens did not know the art of war, they began to hire foreigners for their pay. The first to give reputation to these militias was Alberico of Romagna, from whose school emerged, among others, the Bracchi, who were in their time the arbiters of Italy. After them came all those who, until our days, have led these troops and the result of their virtue is found in the fact that Italy has been freely traversed by Charles, pillaged by Louis, violated by Ferdinand, and insulted by the Swiss. The method followed by these captains to acquire reputation was first to minimize infantry. They did this because not having lands and needing to live by their industry, they did not seek to impose themselves with few infantry, and it was impossible for them to feed many people. On the other hand, with a small number of cavalry, they were honoured without issue. They pushed this to such an extreme that there were not 2,000 foot soldiers in an army of 20,000 men. Moreover, they arranged to avoid fatigue and fear for themselves and their soldiers by ordering not to kill in skirmishes, but to take prisoners without slaughtering them. They did not attack cities at night, nor peasants, nor merchants. They did not build palisades or ditches around their camp, and they did not live there in winter. All these things, allowed by their military codes, they invented, as I have said, to avoid fatigue and danger, and with them, they brought Italy to slavery and shame. Chapter 13 of Mixed and Native Auxiliary Soldiers Auxiliary troops, others of the useless troops, of which I have spoken, are those requested from a powerful prince so that he may come to our aid and defend us as Pope Julius recently did. Following the mediocre role played by his mercenary troops in the Ferrara enterprise, he had to call upon auxiliary troops and agree with Ferdinand, King of Spain, to come to his aid with his armies. These troops may be useful and good for their masters, but for the one who calls them, they are almost always fatal. For if they lose, he is defeated, and if they win, he becomes their prisoner. And although ancient histories abound with such examples, I nevertheless want to dwell on the recent case of Julius II, who could not have committed a greater imprudence in conquering Ferrara than by surrendering entirely into the hands of a foreigner. But his lucky star brought forth a third cause, which otherwise would have made him suffer the consequences of his poor choice. For defeated, his auxiliaries at Ravenna, the Swiss appeared, and contrary to general opinion, 
even their own, put the fleeing victors to flight, so that he did not remain a prisoner of the fleeing enemies nor of the auxiliaries, since he triumphed with other troops. The Florentines lacking their own armies brought in 10,000 Frenchmen to conquer Pisa, a decision that exposed them to more dangers than ever before. Consequently, anyone who does not intend to conquer need only employ these troops, far more dangerous than mercenaries, as they are perfectly united and elegantly obey their leaders, leading to immediate ruin, whereas mercenaries, to subdue a prince once they have triumphed, must await time and opportunity, being not a united body and in the pay of the prince. With them, a third that the prince made chief can't immediately gain authority to harm him. In sum, in the mercenary troops, it is above all necessary to fear the defeats, while in the auxiliaries, it is necessary to hope for the victories. This is why every prudent prince has rejected these troops and taken refuge in his, preferring to lose with them than to gain with the others, considering that a victory won with foreign weapons isn't a true victory. I will never tire of praising Caesar Borgia and his conduct. At the beginning, the Duke invaded the Romagna with auxiliary troops, all composed of French soldiers, and with them he took Mola. But judging them not safe, he turned to the mercenaries whom he considered less dangerous and hired the Orsini and the Vitelli. Finally, realizing that even these troops were unreliable, unfaithful and dangerous, he dissolved them and turned to his own. And the difference between these different militias can be seen by considering the authority that the Duke had when only the French were there, when he relied on the Orsini and the Vitelli, and that which he had when he remained with his soldiers and relied on himself, who was undoubtedly much greater, as he has never been as respected, as when he was the sole master of his troops. I had planned not to leave the Italian and recent examples, but I don't want to forget Jerome of Syracuse. Since it is mentioned elsewhere, converted as I explained into the head of the armies of Syracuse, immediately he noticed the uselessness of the mercenary militias whose leaders had the same effects as our Italians, and as he didn't think it useful to retain them or to disband them, he eliminated their leaders and waged war with his own troops, and not with those of others. I also want to recall an episode from the Old Testament that is very relevant. David offered himself to Saul to fight Goliath, the Philistine provocateur. To give him courage, Saul armed him with his weapons, but once loaded with them, David rejected them, saying that he couldn't benefit from them and preferred to go out to meet the enemy with his sling and his knife. Chapter 14 On the duties of a prince towards the militia. A prince should have no other objective, thought or concern than the art of war and what pertains to his command and discipline, for this is the only thing that concerns one who commands. His virtue is such that it not only retains those born as princes in their positions, but often elevates men of humble origin to this dignity, while on the contrary, it has caused states to be lost by princes who thought more of diversions than of arms. For the main reason for the loss of a state always lies in the neglect of this art, while the primary condition for acquiring it is to be skilled in it. Francesco Sforza, by means of arms, became Duke of Milan from being a simple citizen, and his sons, to avoid the drawbacks of ducal arms, became simple citizens. Besides the other evils caused by being unarmed, this renders one contemptible. A shame to be avoided, as I will explain later, for between an armed man and an unarmed man there is no possible comparison, and it is not reasonable that an armed man should readily obey a man who is not armed, and that a disarmed prince should feel secure among armed servants, for one being contemptuous and the other mistrustful, it is not possible for them to agree. Consequently, a prince who, in addition to other misfortunes, does not understand military matters cannot be esteemed by his soldiers, nor have confidence in them. Therefore, a prince should never cease to occupy himself with the military art, and during times of peace he should practice it more than during times of war, which he can do in two ways, through action and through study. Regarding action, he must, in addition to training and organizing his troops appropriately, constantly dedicate himself to physical exercise with the dual purpose of accustoming the body to hardships and understanding the nature of terrains, the elevation of mountains, the entrances to valleys, the layout of plains, the courses of rivers, and the extent of marshes. He should invest serious effort in this latter activity, as such study offers two benefits. 
First, it allows him to know the region where he lives and better defend it. Second, through practical knowledge of one region, it is easier to understand another region where action is necessary, because the hills, valleys, plains, rivers and marshes that exist, for example in Tuscany, have certain similarities with those of other provinces, so knowledge of the terrains of one province is useful for others. The prince who lacks this expertise lacks the primary quality that distinguishes a captain, for such a condition teaches one to spot the enemy, choose accommodations, lead armies, prepare a battle plan, and attack advantageously. Philippoimen, prince of the Achaeans, had among his other merits, which historians attributed to him, that he only thought during times of peace of things that concern war. He often paused while walking in the countryside, reflecting thus with his friends on the enemy's situation on that hill, while we find ourselves here with our army. What would be the advantage of their position? How could we meet them while maintaining order? If we should retreat, how should we proceed? And how shall we pursue them if they retreat? He thus proposed while walking, all the cases that may occur to an army, listened to their opinions, expressed his own, and justified them. And thanks to this continuous reflection, no unexpected incident could occur to his armies. As for exercising the mind, the prince must study history, examine the actions of illustrious men, see how they behaved in war, analyze the reasons for their victories and defeats, to avoid the latter, and attempt to achieve the former. And above all, he must do what certain Hebrew men have done in the past, who, taking others as models, always kept in mind their most famous exploits, as it is said that Alexander the Great did with Achilles, Caesar with Alexander, Scipio with Cyrus. Anyone who reads the life of Cyrus written by Xenophon will recognize in the life of Scipio the glory he acquired by imitating it. And as for chastity, benevolence, clemency and generosity, Scipio fully adhered to what Xenophon wrote about Cyrus. This is the conduct that a prudent prince must observe, never remaining inactive during times of peace, but rather accumulating teachings to be able to use them in times of adversity, so that if fortune changes, he is ready to resist it. Chapter 15. Things for which men, and particularly princes, are praised or blamed. It now remains to analyze how a prince should behave in his relations with his subjects and friends. Because I know that many have written on this subject, I wonder as I write now if I will not be accused of presumption, especially when I see that in this matter I depart from their opinions. However, aiming to write something useful for those who understand it, it seemed more appropriate to me to search for the actual truth of the matter, rather than its appearance, since many have imagined republics and principalities that have never been seen or known. For there is so much difference between the way things are and the way they should be, that one who abandons what is done for what should be done will bring about his downfall rather than his preservation. Therefore, a man who wishes to be esteemed everywhere is inevitably destined to ruin, for it is necessary for every prince who wishes to maintain himself to learn not to be good, and to use or not use goodness according to necessity, disregarding fantasies, and focusing solely on realities. I say that all men, when spoken of, and particularly princes due to their higher position, are judged based on certain qualities that earn them either censure or praise. One is called prodigal, another miserly. And I use a Tuscan term because miserly in our language also refers to one who seeks to enrich himself through plunder, while we call miserly one who abstains too much from spending what is rightfully his. One is considered generous, another greedy. One cruel, another merciful. One treacherous, another loyal. One effeminate and timid, another decisive and courageous. One humane, another arrogant. One licentious, another chaste. One sincere, another cunning. One severe, another frivolous, one religious, another unbelieving, and so on. I know that there would be no one who would not think it highly commendable for a prince to possess among all the mentioned qualities those that are considered good, but as it is not possible to possess them all, or to always observe them, because human nature does not allow it, he must be so wise as to know how to avoid the shame of those that would mean the loss of the state, and if possible even those that would not. But if he cannot, he should not overly concern himself with it, 
and even less fall into infamy because of vices which could hardly save the state. For if we examine this objectively, we will sometimes find that what seems to be virtues are the cause of ruin, and what seems to be a vice ultimately brings about well-being and security. Chapter 16 On Prodigality and Avarice Beginning with the first of the qualities mentioned, I say that it would be good to be reputed as prodigal. However, prodigality practiced in such a way that one is known to be prodigal is harmful. On the other hand, if it is practiced virtuously, and as it should be, prodigality will not be recognized, and the opposite vice will be assumed to exist. But since one who wishes to gain a reputation for prodigality among men cannot abstain from any kind of luxury, it will always happen that a prince accustomed to acting in this manner will dissipate all his wealth and will ultimately be obliged, if he wishes to preserve his reputation, to impose excessive taxes, to proceed rigorously in collection, and to do everything necessary to procure money. This will start to become odious in the eyes of his subjects, and no one will esteem him, for he will have become poor, and since his prodigality will have harmed many and benefited few, he will feel the slightest inconvenience and perish at the slightest risk. And if he then notices his fault and wishes to change his conduct, he will be called miserly, for a prince cannot openly practice this virtue without suffering for it. Therefore, if he is wise, he should not concern himself with being called miserly. For over time, seeing that with his frugality he has enough revenue to defend himself against those who wage war against him, and to undertake new enterprises without burdening the people, he will always be considered more prodigal, as he practices generosity with all those to whom he does not take anything, who are countless, and avarice with all those to whom he does not give anything, who are few. In our times, we have seen great accomplishments achieved only by men considered miserly. The others have always failed. Pope Julius II, after using a reputation for prodigality to ascend to the pontificate, did not concern himself with preserving this reputation in order to wage war. The current king of France has waged so many wars without imposing extraordinary taxes on his subjects, for with his extreme economy he has provided for the superfluous. The current king of Spain, if he had been prodigal, would not have accomplished or won so many enterprises. Therefore a prince must spend little to defend himself, not rob his subjects, avoid becoming poor and contemptible, refrain from being seen as a plunderer and not fall into the vice of avarice as it is one of the vices that enables rulership. If someone were to say, it is thanks to his prodigality that Caesar rose to the empire and many others by being and gaining a reputation for prodigality have attained high positions, I would reply, either you are already a prince or you are on the way to becoming one. In the former case, liberality is harmful. In the latter, it is necessary. Caesar was one of those who sought to ascend to the Principate of Rome, but if he had survived after obtaining it and had not moderated his expenditures, he would have led the empire to ruin. And if someone argued that there have been many princes renowned for their liberality who have achieved great things with arms, I would say, either the prince spends his own or his subjects, or he spends others. In the former case he must be measured. In the latter he should not concern himself with waste, for the prince who marches with his armies and lives off plunder and contributions needs this magnificence at the expense of enemies, otherwise soldiers would not follow him. With what belongs neither to the prince nor his subjects, one can be extremely generous as Cyrus Caesar and Alexander were, because wasting others' resources garners more reputation than taking them away. Only wasting one's own harms, nothing is consumed as much as prodigality, for the more it is practiced, the more the ability to practice it is lost and the prince becomes poor and contemptible, or if he wishes to escape poverty, a plunderer and detestable. And if something must be avoided, it is being despised and detested, and prodigality leads to both. Therefore it is wiser to settle for the label of miserly, which implies shame without hatred, than to gain the reputation of prodigal and fall into plundering, which implies shame with hatred. Chapter 17. On Cruelty and Clemency. And if it is better to be loved than feared, or feared than loved, I move on to the other qualities already established, 
and declare that all princes should desire to be considered as merciful rather than cruel, yet they must take care not to misuse this clemency. Caesar was already considered cruel, but it was nonetheless his cruelty that imposed order on Rome, ensured its unity, and restored it to peace and faith. Therefore he will be considered more merciful than those who, through excessive leniency, allow disorder to proliferate, causing massacres and pillaging that harm entire populations, whereas extreme measures taken by the prince only harm himself. It is especially a new prince who must not avoid acts of cruelty, for every new dominion brings with it a multitude of dangers. He must therefore be cautious in his beliefs and actions, not be afraid of himself and act with moderation, prudence and humanity, so that excessive trust does not make him reckless, and excessive distrust does not become unbearable. From this arises a question. Is it better to be loved than feared or feared than loved? There is nothing better than being both at once, but as it is difficult to combine them and one will always be lacking, I declare that it is safer to be feared than loved, for this can be said of the general populace. They are ungrateful, fickle pretenders, cowards in the face of danger and eager for profit. As long as you do them good, they are entirely yours, offering you their blood, their property, their lives and their children, but as soon as necessity arises they turn against you. Therefore it will suffice for him to refrain from seizing the property and wives of his citizens and subjects, and to proceed against someone's life only when there is suitable justification and clear cause. But above all he must refrain from seizing others' property, for men forget the death of their father more quickly than the loss of their inheritance. Moreover, there is never a shortage of excuses for plundering others' property, and one who begins to live off plunder always finds reasons to appropriate what belongs to others. On the other hand, to take a life, reasons are rarer and fade more quickly. But when the prince is at the head of his armies and must govern thousands of soldiers, it is absolutely necessary that he not care about earning the reputation of cruel, for without this reputation he can never have a united and combat-ready army. Among the countless admirable qualities of Hannibal, it is mentioned that with an immense army composed of men from all races whom he led to fight on foreign lands, never did discord arise among them, nor against the prince, whether in bad fortune or good. And this could only be due to his inhumane cruelty, which, combined with his many other virtues, made him venerable and formidable in the eyes of the soldiers. Thoughtless historians admire such order on one hand and criticize his main reason on the other. If other virtues had not sufficed for him, this can be seen with Scipio, a man of uncommon qualities not only in his speech but in all of human history, whose armies revolted in Spain, which happened due to his excessive leniency. Returning to the question of being loved or feared, he concludes that since love depends on the will of men and fear on the will of the prince, a prudent prince should rely on what belongs to him and not on what is foreign, but as I have said, always striving to avoid hatred. Chapter 18 On the manner in which princes should keep their promises, no one can deny how praiseworthy is the prince who keeps his word, who acts with rectitude and not with duplicity. But experience shows us, from what happens in our days, that it is precisely those princes who have least regarded their sworn faith, who have ensnared others with their cunning and laughed at those who trusted in their loyalty, who alone have accomplished great enterprises. Let us first say that there are two ways of fighting, one with laws, the other with force. The first is distinctive of man, the second of beasts. But as often the first alone is insufficient, recourse to the second is necessary. A prince must then know how to behave both like a beast and like a man. This is what the ancient writers taught princes in veiled terms when they said that Achilles and many other ancient princes were entrusted to the centaur Chiron to be raised and educated, which means that just as the tutor is half beast and half man, a prince must know how to employ the qualities of both natures and that one cannot endure long without the other. Thus, since he is compelled to behave like a beast, it is fitting that the prince transform into both fox and lion, for the lion does not know how to protect himself from traps, nor the fox how to protect himself from wolves. Therefore, one must be a fox to discern the traps, 
and a lion to frighten off the wolves. Those who rely solely on the qualities of the lion show little experience. Therefore, a prudent prince should not observe sworn faith when such observance goes against his interests and when the reasons that led him to promise have disappeared. If all men were good, this precept would not be good, but as they are perverse and would not observe it towards you either, you must never observe it with them. Princes have never lacked legitimate reasons to mask their non-observance. Countless modern examples could be cited of peace treaties and promises rendered useless by princes' faithlessness. He who has best known how to be a fox has triumphed. But one must know how to disguise oneself well and be skilled in feigning and dissimulation, for men are so simple and so governed by immediate needs that he who deceives will always find someone to deceive. I do not wish to omit one of the contemporary examples. Alexander VI never did or thought anything other than to deceive men, and he always found the opportunity to do so. Never has a man made more confident promises, nor sworn more oaths, without keeping any. And yet deceptions have always succeeded marvellously for him, for he understood this part of the world well. It is not necessary for a prince to possess all the aforementioned virtues, but it is indispensable that he appear to possess them. And I will even dare to say this, having and practising these virtues is always harmful, whereas appearing to have them is beneficial. It is good to display piety, loyalty, humanity, rectitude and religiosity, and to actually possess them. But one must be ready to go to the extreme opposite if necessary. It must be borne in mind that a prince, especially a new prince, cannot observe all the things that make men considered good. For often, to maintain power, he is compelled to act against faith, charity, humanity and religion. Therefore, he must have an intelligence capable of adapting to all circumstances, and as I have said before, not deviate from good as long as he can. But in times of necessity, he must not hesitate to resort to evil. For all these reasons, a prince must be very careful never to utter anything that is not imbued with the five aforementioned virtues, and he must ensure that, when seen and heard, one thinks of clemency, faith, rectitude, and religion itself, especially the latter, for men generally judge more with their eyes than with their hands. For all can see, but few can touch, all see what appears to be, but few know what you are, and these dare not oppose the opinion of the majority which seeks refuge behind the majesty of the state and in the actions of men, particularly princes, where there is no appeal possible. They focus on outcomes. Therefore a prince must strive to conquer and maintain the state in a manner that is always honourable and praised by all, for the crowd is easily deceived by appearances and success, and in the world there is only the crowd, as minorities count only when majorities have nothing on which to rely. A prince of our time, to whom it is never opportune to name, preaches nothing other than concord and good faith, and is the staunch enemy of both, for if he had observed them, he would have lost his reputation and lands more than once. Chapter 19. How to avoid being despised and hated. Having already spoken of the most important qualities among those mentioned, I now wish, under this general title, to briefly refer to the others. The prince must avoid the things that make him odious or contemptible and once this is accomplished, he will have fulfilled his duty and will have nothing to fear from other vices. Particularly odious are actions such as seizing the property and women of his subjects. All of these must be abstained from for most men as long as they are not deprived of their property and honour, live happily, and the prince remains free to combat the ambitions of the few, which he can easily sever in a thousand different ways. Rendered contemptible, are qualities such as being considered fickle, frivolous, effeminate, pusillanimous, and irresolute, defects from which he must distance himself like a ship from a reef, and he must strive to ensure that his actions demonstrate greatness, courage, seriousness, and strength. Regarding the private affairs of his subjects, he must ensure that his decisions are irrevocable and endeavour to acquire such authority that no one thinks to deceive him or ensnare him in intrigues. A prince who acquires such authority is always respected, for it is difficult to conspire against one who, being respected, must necessarily be good and beloved by his own. A prince must have two things within him, subjects who do not revolt and foreign powers that do not attack him. 
he will defend against the latter with good arms and good alliances, and he who possesses good arms will always have good alliances. Thus, as long as things are secure externally, they will also be so internally, unless they have been previously disrupted by a conspiracy. And even if external enemies threaten if he has lived as I have advised and does not lose his composure, he will resist all attacks as I advise the Spartan Nabis concerning his subjects, and although there is no foreign threat, he must ensure that they do not secretly plot against him. But from this danger, one can guard against by avoiding being hated or despised, and as I have repeated previously, by striving through all means to satisfy the people, for not being hated by the people is one of the most effective remedies available to a prince against conspiracies. The conspirator always believes that the people will rejoice at the death of the prince, and never, if he suspects the opposite effect will occur, does he decide to take such action? For the dangers faced by one who conspires are infinite. Experience shows us that there have been numerous conspiracies, and very few have succeeded, for the conspirator cannot act alone, nor seek the complicity of those he does not believe dissatisfied. And there is no discontent that does not rejoice as soon as you have entrusted it with your intentions, for from the revelation of your secret it can hope for all sorts of benefits. It must be very friendly to you or a staunch enemy of the prince, so that finding on one side sure gains and on the other uncertain but full of danger, he wishes to be loyal. And to reduce the problem to its simplest terms, I declare that on the side of the conspirator, there are only suspicions, suspicions, and fear of punishment, while the prince relies on the majesty of the principality, on the laws, and on the assistance of his friends, so that if he has gained popular favor, it is impossible for anyone as reckless to conspire. For if a conspirator is generally surrounded by dangers before committing the act, he will be even more so after executing it, as he will find refuge nowhere. On this point many examples could be cited, but I will suffice to mention one belonging to the time of our fathers. My late grandfather, Annibal Venteo, Prince of Bologna, was assassinated by the Canici who had conspired against him, leaving behind only my uncle Juan, who was still a child. Immediately after such a crime, the people revolted and exterminated all the Canici. This testifies to the sympathy that the Venteo family had at the time, which was so great that with no one left in Bologna who could lead the state in Annibal's absence, and having clues suggesting that there was in Florence a descendant of the Venteo family, hitherto regarded as the son of a locksmith, the Bolognese came to fetch him in Florence and entrusted him with the government of that city, which he managed until my uncle Juan reached the appropriate age to take the reins of power. I thus arrive at the conclusion that a prince who is appreciated by the people must concern himself very little with conspiracies, but he must fear everything and everyone who hold him as an enemy and hate him. Well-organized states and wise princes have always ensured not to exasperate the nobles while satisfying and pleasing the people. This is one of the points on which a prince must pay the most attention in our days. Among well-organized kingdoms, one can cite that of France which has many institutions beneficial to the service of liberty and security of the king, the foremost being the parliament. For the one who organized this kingdom knew on the one hand the ambition and violence of the powerful and the necessity of maintaining them as a break to correct them, and on the other the hatred of the nobles which inspired fear to the people, fear which had to dispel, therefore disposed to task not exclusively that it should not. Therefore he created a third power which, without responsibilities towards the king, would punish the nobles and favour the people. One could not imagine a better measure, more judicious or more secure for the king and the kingdom. Hence we can draw this noteworthy conclusion that princes should entrust difficult tasks to others and reserve the pleasant ones for themselves, and I reiterate that a prince should esteem the nobles without making himself hated by the people, it may seem to many that the example of the life and death of certain Roman emperors contradicts my opinions, for there were those who, despite always conducting themselves virtuously and possessing great qualities, lost the empire or worse, were assassinated by their own conspiring subjects. To respond to these objections, I will examine the behavior of certain emperors and demonstrate that the causes of their downfall do not differ from those I have laid out, 
and in the meantime, I will recount the most striking facts of the history of that era. I will limit myself to discussing the emperors who succeeded from Marcus the Philosopher to Maximinus. Marcus, his son Commodus, Pertinax, Julian, Severus, his son Antoninus, Caracalla, Macrinus, Elagabalus, Alexander, and Maximinus. Firstly, it is important to note that while today's princes only have to contend with the ambition of the nobles and the violence of the people, Roman emperors faced a third difficulty, the greed and cruelty of their soldiers, which caused the ruin of many. It was difficult to satisfy both the soldiers and the people simultaneously. While the people loved peace and calm princes, the troops preferred warlike, violent, cruel and greedy princes, especially if they directed these qualities against the people, as it allowed them to double their gains and satisfy their avarice and malice. This explains why emperors who lacked sufficient authority to restrain both sides always failed, and also explains why most, especially those who ascended the throne through inheritance, once realizing the impossibility of satisfying both parties, leaned towards the soldiers, disregarding the people. This was the logical course when a prince cannot avoid being hated by one of the two parties. He must lean towards the more numerous group, and when that is not possible, lean towards the stronger. That is why emperors who, having reached the throne for reasons other than right, required extraordinary support, sought first to satisfy the soldiers rather than the people, which could either be advantageous or not, depending on whether they knew how to earn and keep their respect. For these reasons, Marcus, Pertinax and Alexander, despite their moderate lives, were deposed, mutilated and assassinated. Despite their love for justice, their aversion to cruelty, their humanitarianism and benevolence, they all except Marcus met a tragic end, whereas Marcus lived and died loved. This can be explained by the fact that he ascended to the throne by inheritance rights, owing nothing to either the people or the soldiers, and adorned with numerous virtues that made him venerable. He managed to maintain control over both sides as long as he lived, without ever being hated or despised. However, P.T. Max became emperor against the soldiers' advice, who, accustomed to the licentiousness under Commodus, could not tolerate the virtuous life he tried to impose on them. Therefore, he was hated, and as hatred was compounded by the contempt inspired by his old age, he perished at the beginning of his reign itself. It should be noted here that both good deeds and bad actions can earn hatred, which is why, as I have said before, a prince who wishes to retain power is often compelled not to be good. When the group upon which you rely to maintain your rule is corrupted, it is necessary to follow their whims to satisfy them, for good actions would become their enemies. Let us now focus on Alexander, a man of great kindness, who received praise for not executing anyone without a trial during his 14-year reign. However, his reputation for weakness and submission to his mother earned him the contempt of the soldiers, who revolted and killed him. Conversely, Commodus, Severus, Antoninus, Caracalla and Maximinus served as examples of extreme cruelty and despotism to win over the soldiers. They did not refrain from outraging the people, and all except Severus met a tragic end. Severus, although he oppressed the people, was able to rule happily due to the support of the soldiers and his great qualities, which made him so admirable in the eyes of both the people and the army, who were respectful and satisfied, and the others frightened and bewildered. Because of his remarkable actions for a new prince, I want to briefly explain how he acted cunningly as both a fox and a lion, qualities that, as I mentioned earlier, should be imitated by all princes. Informed that Emperor Julian was a coward, Severus persuaded the army he commanded in Illyria that it was necessary to go to Rome to avenge the death of Petinax murdered by the Praetorians. Under this pretext, without revealing his imperial ambitions, he led the army against Rome and found himself in Italy before anyone knew of his departure. Once in Rome he killed Julian, and the Senate, filled with terror, elected him emperor. However, to seize the state, Severus still faced two difficulties, the first in the east, where Niger, the head of the armies of Asia, had declared himself emperor, the second in the west, where Albinus, who also had claims to the throne, resided. As he found it dangerous to declare himself an enemy of both, he decided to attack Niger and deceive Albinus. He wrote to the latter, saying that, elected emperor by the senate, 
He wanted to share the throne with him, sent him the title of Caesar, and, in agreement with the Senate, made him his colleague, a distinction Albinus accepted without hesitation. However, once he had defeated and killed Niger and calmed things in the east, he returned to Rome and complained to the Senate that Albinus, forgetting the favours owed to him, had treated him wickedly and tried to kill him. He then sought him out in Gaul and took both his life and his state. Anyone who carefully examines the actions of Severus will see that he was both a fierce lion and a very cunning fox, and will observe that everyone feared and respected him. It is not surprising that this new prince could master such a vast empire, as his unlimited authority always protected him from the hatred his plundering could have instilled in the people. But Antoninus, his son, was also a man of qualities that made him admirable in the eyes of the people. A pleasant man to the soldiers, a genius in warfare, tough against fatigue, an enemy of malice and the pleasures of the table, he could not help but be beloved by all the soldiers. However, his ferocity was so great and unprecedented that after countless isolated assassinations, he exterminated a large part of the Roman people and all of those in Alexandria. For this reason, he became odious to everyone, began to be feared by those around him, and ultimately was killed by a centurion in the presence of the entire army. It is worth noting in this regard that no prince has the power to prevent such attacks, which are the result of the firm resolve of a strong-willed individual, for he who does not fear death will not hesitate to take the life of another. But let princes not fear such acts, for they are exceedingly rare. Rather concern yourselves with avoiding grave offences against those who are by your side in service of the state. This is what Antoninus did not do, for despite ignominiously killing a brother of the centurion and threatening him daily with the same fate, he kept him in his personal guard, inspiring in him the tranquility in which he was to bring about his death. Moving on to Commodus, who being the son of Marcus and inheriting the empire, could have easily retained it by simply following in his father's footsteps, which would have pleased both the people and the army. However, he was a cruel and brutal man who, to satisfy his rapacious greed against the people, tried to gain favour with the troops by allowing them all sorts of indulgences. On the other hand, forgetting the dignity that obliged him, he often appeared in the arena to fight with gladiators and committed base acts incompatible with imperial majesty. This earned him the soldiers' contempt, so that hated by one group and despised by the other, he was assassinated as a result of a conspiracy. Next, let us examine the qualities of Maximinus, provoked by the inaction of Alexander, whom I have already mentioned. The troops, once Alexander was dead, raised him to the empire. A man of extraordinarily warlike spirit, he did not hold power for long because two things made him odious and contemptible. Firstly, his humble origins, for no one ignored that he had been a shepherd in Thrace, which elicited universal disgust. Secondly, his reputation for bloodthirstiness. Thus he delayed his departure for Rome to take command, and during the interval, through his prefects, he committed a multitude of plunderings in Rome and throughout the empire. Despised due to the baseness of his origin, and hated out of fear of his ferocity, it was natural that everyone felt uneasy. Africa revolted, the Senate and then the people of Rome and all of Italy conspired against him. His own army, while besieging Aquileia without being able to take it, weary of his cruelties and fearing the least, when they saw him surrounded by so many enemies, followed suit and killed him. I do not wish to speak of Heliogabalus, Macrinus and Julian, who, being sufficiently contemptible, soon met their end. I will focus on the conclusions of this discourse. Current princes do not face the difficulty of having to excessively satisfy the soldiers, for although they must treat them with consideration, the situation is less severe, as these princes do not have their own armies closely tied to governments and provincial administrations, as was the case with the Roman Empire. If in that era it was known that bending to satisfy the soldiers before the people was because the soldiers were more powerful than the people, today all princes, except the Turk and the Sultan, must first satisfy the people rather than the soldiers, for the former can do more than the latter, except for the Turk, who is always surrounded by 12,000 infantrymen and 15,000 horsemen on whom the security and strength of the kingdom depend, he must defer all other concerns to maintaining the friendship of the troops. 
Similarly, the Sultan, whose kingdom is entirely in the hands of the army, must retain their sympathy without regard for the people. It should be noted that this state of the Sultan is very different from all principalities and resembles only the Christian papacy. It cannot be called either a hereditary principality or a new principality, for it is not the sons of the old prince who are the heirs and future princes, but those chosen for the position by those who have authority, and since it is an ancient institution, it does not deserve the name of a new principality. Furthermore, they do not encounter the obstacles faced by new ones, for although the prince is new, the state's constitution is ancient, and the ruler is received as one who is by hereditary right. But let us return to our subject. Anyone who meditates on this discourse will find that the cause of the ruin of the emperors mentioned was hatred or contempt, and will discover why, while some acted in one way and others in another, in both cases there were those who were fortunate and those who were not, and Alexander failed because, being a new prince, he sought to emulate Marcus, who attained the empire through hereditary right, as did Caracalla, Commodus and Maximinus, in attempting to follow Severus's footsteps without possessing his qualities. Consequently, for a new prince in a new state, he cannot imitate Marcus's behavior nor follow Severus's example, but must acquire the necessary qualities to establish a state. Once established and stable, he should then acquire the qualities necessary to preserve it, although one cannot pass judgment on these matters without knowing the characteristics of the state where such decisions should be made. I will nonetheless speak as broadly as the subject allows. It has never happened that a new prince disarms his subjects. On the contrary, he arms them whenever he finds them unarmed. In this way, the people's weapons become the princes, those who are distrustful become loyal, the loyal remain faithful, and the subjects become supporters. However, since it is not possible to arm all subjects, those whom the prince arms are favoured, and others can live more peacefully because of this distinction, where the former recognise their debt to the prince, consider themselves more obligated to him, and the latter absolve him, understanding that it is necessary for those with greater duties and exposed to greater dangers to enjoy more benefits. But when subjects are disarmed, offences begin by showing them that due to cowardice or mistrust there is little faith in their loyalty, and either opinion breeds hatred against the prince. And since the prince cannot remain disarmed, he is forced to use the mercenary militias that I have already mentioned. But even if they had only virtues, they would not be numerous enough to defend him against powerful enemies and discontented subjects. Therefore, as I have said, a new prince in a new state has never failed to organize his army, as numerous examples from history prove. Now, when a prince acquires a new state to add to the one he already possesses, it is advisable to disarm his new subjects, except for those who declared themselves supporters during the conquest, and even these over time and by seizing opportunities that arise, must be weakened and reduced to inactivity. The state's army should consist of soldiers who surrounded the prince in the former state. Our ancestors, particularly those considered wise, often encouraged discord among subject lands, a very logical measure at a time when Italy's forces were balanced. But I do not believe this can be considered a precept today, as I do not think divisions bring any benefit. Instead, I think it is inevitable that enemy cities are lost as soon as the enemy approaches, as the weaker party will always join the external forces, and the other cannot resist. For these reasons, as I believe, the Venetians encouraged the creation of Guelph and Ghibelline factions in conquered cities, and although they did not allow them to shed blood, they nevertheless maintained these disputes among them, so that occupied by their differences, they would not join together against the common enemy. But as we have seen, this approach turned against them, as defeated in Bologna, one of the parties took courage and snatched their entire state. Such means suggest a certain weakness in the prince, for a strong prince will never tolerate such divisions, which may be useful in peacetime, where they can help him govern his subjects more easily. But they will prove ineffective once war arises. Undoubtedly princes are great when they overcome difficulties and opposition. For this reason, and especially when he wants to elevate a new prince, who needs to acquire fame not yet inherited, fortune stirs up enemies and wars against him to give him the opportunity to overcome them, and using the ladder that enemies have brought him to rise to even greater heights.
There are even those who argue that a skillful prince must cunningly foment certain resistances so that, by crushing them, his glory is increased. Princes, especially new ones, have found more consequences and utility in those who were suspicious of them at the beginning of their reign than in those in whom they had confidence. When Ulfo Petrucci, Prince of Siena, governed his state, he relied more on those who had been suspicious of him than on others. However, no general conclusions can be drawn from this point, as they vary according to the case. I will say only this, men who were enemies at the beginning of a reign, if their character is such that they need support from others to continue their fight, the prince can always and very easily conquer them to his cause, and they will serve him with even greater fidelity, knowing they must erase, through good deeds, the bad opinion in which they were held. Thus, the prince derives more profit from them than from overly faithful subjects who neglect their obligations. And since the subject requires it, I will remind the prince who acquires a new state with the help of citizens to carefully examine the reasons that led them to favour him. For if it is not due to natural affection but dissatisfaction with the previous state of affairs, it will be difficult and tiresome for him to maintain their friendship, as he cannot satisfy them with examples provided by ancient and modern events. Meditate calmly on the reason for all this, and you will see that it is easier to win the friendship of enemies who are such because they were satisfied with the previous government than of friends of the new prince who became friends and helped him conquer the state because they were discontented. Princes to maintain power more firmly used to build fortresses that would serve as a deterrent to those who dared to act against them and as a safe refuge for them in case of unforeseen attack. I commend this ancient custom, but note that in these times we saw Nicholas Vitella demolish two fortresses in Sita and a castle to hold the place. Guido Ubaldo, Duke of Hervino, upon returning to his estates from which Cesar Borgia had driven him, destroyed to their foundations all the fortresses of that province, convinced that without them it would be more difficult to wrest the state from him. The Venetians did the same upon their return to Bologna. Therefore fortresses can be useful or not depending on the circumstances, as while they sometimes provide favour, they sometimes cause harm. The question could be resolved thus. The prince who fears the people more than foreigners should build fortresses, but the one who fears foreigners more than the people should refrain from doing so. The castle erected by Francesco Sforza in Milan has brought and will bring more trouble to the Sforza family than all the revolts that occur in the state. But ultimately, there is no better fortress than not being hated by the people. For if the people hate the prince, all the fortresses he possesses will not save him, as there will always be foreigners to come to the aid of the people once they have taken up arms. In our times, we have not seen foreigners favouring any prince except Countess Forley after the death of her husband, Count Jerome, as thanks to them, she was able to escape popular fury, await assistance from Milan and reclaim the state. But the circumstances were such that foreigners could not aid the people, and afterward her fortress was of no use when Caesar Borgia attacked, and the people rallied to him out of hatred for the countess. Therefore it would have been much safer then and always not to be hated by the people than to possess considered fortresses, for I will praise as much the one who builds fortresses as the one who does not, but I will blame the one who, relying on fortresses, disregards being hated by the people. There cannot be a more admirable and marvellous example. With the same pretext, he invaded Africa, led the campaign in Italy, and recently attacked France, as he constantly meditates and achieves extraordinary exploits that have consistently amazed his subjects and kept his thoughts fully occupied with the success of his adventures. And these actions of his have occurred in such a manner, one after another, that he has not allowed men the time to quietly prepare anything against him. The prince also benefits from devising surprising measures in administration, as Bernabe of Milan used to do, and when any subject accomplishes something remarkable, whether good or bad, in civil life a way must be found to reward or punish them, which gives people something to think about. And above all, the prince must strive to appear great and illustrious in each of his actions. Furthermore, the prince is esteemed capable of being a straightforward friend or enemy, that is one who, without fear of any kind, knows how to openly declare himself in favour of one and against another. Taking sides is always more advantageous than remaining neutral, 
for if two powerful neighbors declare war, the prince may find himself in a situation where, due to the strength of the opponents, he must fear whichever of the two parties wins or loses the war. In either case, it will always be more useful for him to decide for one of the parties and go to war. For in the first case, if he does not decide, he will be at the mercy of the winner, providing pleasure and satisfaction to the winner, and will not find compassion in him or in the other, for the winner does not want suspicious friends and those who do not help in adversity, and the loser cannot offer help to the one who did not want to take up arms and risk for him. Antiochus, called to Greece by the Aetolians to drive out the Romans, sent ambassadors to the Achaeans, who were friends of the Romans, to persuade them to remain neutral. The Romans, on the other hand, asked them to take up arms on their behalf. The matter was debated in the council of the Achaeans, and when Antiochus' envoy asked for neutrality, the Roman representative replied, Yes, yes, fair and sonorous, but if Magus Alienus is Erebus, best Tinegratia Sinetic, the half of Premium Victoria, and you will always see that he who is not your friend demands your neutrality, and he who is your friend demands that you show your feelings with arms. Princes, resolved to avoid present dangers, most often follow the path of neutrality, and most of the time they fail, but when the prince courageously declares himself for one of the parties, if it triumphs, even if it is powerful and he remains at its discretion, they will be united by a bond of gratitude and affection, and men are never so evil as to show such great ingratitude. Victories are never so decisive that the winner does not have to maintain some consideration, especially concerning justice, and if the ally loses, the prince will be supported, aided by him as much as possible, and will become the companion of a fortune that may be reborn. In the second case, when those who fight among themselves cannot inspire any major fear, the need to decide is imposed, because not doing so means the ruin of one of them that the prince, if he is prudent, should save. For if he remains undecided, it is at his discretion, and it is impossible that with his help he does not triumph. It is worth noting that a prince should never ally with another more powerful to attack third parties, except when circumstances require it. For if he were to prevail, he would be at his mercy, and princes must do everything to avoid being at the mercy of other princes. The Venetians, who could have, refrained from intervening, allied themselves with the French against the Duke of Milan, and precipitated their own ruin. But when this cannot be avoided, as happened to the Florentines during the attack of the armies of the Pope and Spain against Lombardy, then for the same reasons set out, the prince must submit to events, and do not think that the states can always tilt towards safe parties. On the contrary, think that all are uncertain. For it happens in the order of things that when one wants to avoid a disadvantage, one falls into another. But prudence lies in knowing the nature of the disadvantages, and accepting the least bad as good. The prince will also show his love for virtue and honour those who stand out in the arts. In addition, he will offer guarantees to citizens so that they can exercise their professions peacefully, trade, agriculture and any other activity, and some will not refrain from beautifying their possessions for fear that they will be taken from them, and others will not open a shop for fear of taxes. Instead, he will institute prizes to reward those who do, and those who try by all means, to enlarge the city or the state. All cities are divided into guilds or corporations to which the prince should pay attention. He should meet with them from time to time and show simplicity and generosity without forgetting the dignity that should never be lacking on any occasion. Chapter 22. Regarding the prince's secretaries, the choice of ministers is not devoid of importance as it will be either good or bad depending on the wisdom of the prince. The first opinion formed about a prince's judgment rests on the men who surround him. If they are capable and faithful, he can be considered wise, for he has known how to find capable men and keep them loyal. But when this is not the case, a prince whose first mistake is in this choice cannot be considered prudent. There was no one who, upon learning that Antonio da Ben was the minister of Pandolfo and Petrucci, prince of Siena, did not judge Pandolfo to be very intelligent for having as his minister the one he did. For there are three kinds of intellects. The first discerns by itself. The second understands what others discern. 
and the third neither discerns nor understands what others discern. The first is excellent, the second good, and the third useless. Therefore, if one does not find oneself in the first case, one must find oneself in the second. For as long as a prince has enough discernment to realize the good or evil he does and says, he will recognize even if he does not discover them himself, which are the good and bad acts of a minister, and can correct the former and praise the latter. And the minister who cannot count on deceiving himself will remain honest and faithful. There is an infallible method of knowing a minister. When one sees that a minister thinks more of himself than of the prince, and in everything seeks only his own profit, one is dealing with a minister who will never be good and in whom the prince can never trust. For he who has the state of another in his hands must never think of himself but of the prince and remind him only of the things that belong to him. For his part, the prince, to maintain his fidelity, must think of the minister, honor him, enrich him, and fill him with offices in such a way that he understands that he cannot do without him, that the many honors do not give him desire for more honors, that the many riches do not give him desire for more riches, and that the many positions do not give him desire for political changes. When ministers and princes behave thus towards ministers, they can trust each other, but when they behave differently, the consequences are harmful to both. Chapter 23. How to Avoid Flatterers I do not want to ignore an important question, namely the fault into which princes easily fall if they are not very prudent or do not choose well, I mean the flatterers who abound in all courts. For men take so much pleasure in their own works, so that they are so deceived that they do not know how to defend themselves against this misfortune, and when they want to defend themselves, they put themselves in danger of becoming contemptible. For there is no other way to avoid flattery than to make men understand that they do not offend by telling the truth, and it follows that when everyone can tell the truth, they lack respect. Therefore a prudent prince must prefer a third mode, to surround himself with judicious men of his state, alone to whom he will give the freedom to tell him the truth, although on the things on which they are questioned and only on them. But he must question them on all subjects, listen to their opinions with patience, and then decide for himself and at his discretion, and with these counsellors behave in such a way that no one ignores that he will be all the more esteemed as he speaks more freely outside of them, not listening to any other immediately putting into practice what he has decided and being obstinate in his execution. He who does not proceed thus is lost because of flatterers, or if he changes his mind often, he is held in less esteem. In this regard, I want to cite a modern example. Brother Lucas Rinaldi, ambassador to the current Emperor Maximilian, said in speaking of His Majesty that he asked no one for advice and yet never did what he wanted, precisely because he acted contrary to what was advised, because the emperor is a reserved man who communicates his thoughts to no one and asks for no advice, but as in wanting to put them into practice, they begin to be known and revealed, and those around him disagree. He ends up abandoning them. As a result, today he does what he undoes tomorrow. We never understand what he wants or tries to do, and we cannot rely on his decisions. For this reason, a prince must always ask for advice, but when he deems it appropriate, and not when others deem it appropriate. Therefore he must prevent anyone from expressing opinions until he is questioned. He must often ask questions, patiently listen to the truth on the subjects he has questioned about, and be offended when he discovers that someone has not told him the truth out of fear. Those who believe that a prince is judged wise by the good counsellors around him, and not by his own qualities, because it is a general rule that never fails. A prince who is not wise cannot be well advised, and therefore he cannot govern unless he places himself under the tutelage of a very prudent man who guides him in everything. Even in this case, he would not last long in power, because the minister would soon strip him of his state. And if he seeks advice from more than one person, the advice will always be different, and a prince who is not wise cannot reconcile them, each of the advisers will think of their own interests, and he will not be able to know or correct it. And it is impossible to find another class of counsellors, because men will always behave badly as long as necessity does not compel them to act differently. It follows, therefore, that it is better that good advice come from somewhere born of the prince's prudence, 
and not from the prince's prudence of good advice. Chapter 24 Because the princes of Italy have lost their states, the rules that I have just set forth, put into practice with prudence, give the appearance of antiquity to a new prince and immediately consolidate and strengthen him in the state as if he were a hereditary prince, because the behavior of a new prince is much more closely observed than that of a hereditary prince. If men find him virtuous, they feel more grateful and attached to him than to one of ancient lineage, because men gain much better with present things than with past things, and when there is profit in present things, they enjoy it without asking for anything, and as long as the prince does not devalue himself in other areas, they will always be ready to defend him. Thus the prince will have the double glory of having created a new principality and of having improved and strengthened it with good laws, good arms, good friends and good examples. Similarly, the shame will be double for one who, being born a prince, loses the throne through lack of prudence. If we examine the behaviour of the princes of Italy who lost their states such as the King of Naples, the Duke of Milan and a few others, we will notice first concerning arms, a common fault in all, that of having deviated from the previously stated rules. Then we will see that some had the people as enemies, and he who had it as a friend did not know how to secure the nobles. Because without these faults, one does not lose states that have enough resources to raise a field army. Philip of Macedonia, not the father of Alexander, but the one defeated by Livy, had a reduced army compared to that of the Greeks and Romans who attacked him together. However, as he was a warrior and had managed to win the favour of the people and restrain the nobles, he was able to resist a struggle for several years, and if he eventually lost some cities, he retained the kingdom. Therefore, those princes of Italy who had been in power for many years do not blame fortune for losing it, but their own ineptitude, as in times of peace they never thought that things could change. This common effect of men not worrying about the storm during the calm, when adverse times arrived, they knew how to flee but not defend themselves, and they hoped that the people, tired of the outrages of the victors, would call them back, which is good when there are no other options, but it is very bad to abandon others for that, because we should not let ourselves fall simply because we believe that someone will catch us, because there is none, and if there is one, he does not come for our salvation, because the defence was unworthy and did not depend on us. And the only defences that are good, safe and enduring are those that depend on oneself and one's virtues. Chapter 25. On the power of fortune over human affairs and means to oppose it. I do not ignore that many believe and have believed that the affairs of the world are governed by fortune and by God in such a way that the most prudent men cannot change them and that they have no recourse against them. From this one could conclude that it is not worth exerting oneself greatly in matters and that it is better to be guided by fate. This opinion has enjoyed greater credibility in our time due to the extraordinary, completely unpredictable changes that have occurred and continue to occur every day. And I sometimes thinking of this have been somewhat inclined to share the same opinion. However, so that our free will does not disappear, I accept that fortune certainly judges half of our actions but it leaves us to govern the other half or a little less, and I compare it to one of those ancient rivers which, when they overflow, flood the plains, bring down trees and houses, and carry away the earth from one place to another. Everyone flees before them, everyone yields to their fury, and even if this is inevitable, it is good for men, in times when there is nothing to fear, to take precautions with dikes and repairs, so that if the river overflows again or needs to be channelled, its force is not as unleashed or as damaging. Thus it is with fortune, which manifests all its power where there is no virtue ready to resist it, and directs its impulses where it knows there have been no dikes or repairs to contain it. And if we now contemplate Italy, the theatre of these changes and the point that engendered them, we will see that it is a plain without dikes or repairs of any kind, and that if it had been defended by the necessary virtue, as Germany, Spain and France are, this flood would not have caused the great transformations it has caused, or would not have occurred at all. And what I have said suffices on the general necessity of opposing fortune. But delving further into the details, I wonder why a prince who lives in prosperity today finds himself in misfortune tomorrow, 
without any change having occurred in his character or conduct. In my opinion, this is primarily due to the reasons I have detailed elsewhere, namely that the prince who blindly trusts in fortune perishes as soon as it changes. I also believe that one who manages to act according to the nature of circumstances is happy, and likewise one who fails to harmonize one thing with another is unhappy. For it is seen that men, in order to achieve the goal they set for themselves, namely glory and wealth, proceed differently, one with prudence, another with impetuosity, one through violence, another through cunning, one with patience, another with its opposite, and all can succeed through such disparate means. It is also observed that among two prudent men, one achieves his goal and the other does not, and that two men who have followed opposite paths have the same fortune, proceeding one with prudence and the other with impetuosity, which is solely due to the nature of circumstances that reconcile or not with the way of acting. Hence what I have said, that two people acting differently achieve the same result, and that two people acting in the same way, one achieves their goal and the other does not. On this depends success itself, for if circumstances and events present themselves in such a way that the prudent and patient prince is favoured, his government will be good and he will be happy. But if they change, he is lost, because he does not change his behaviour with the circumstances. But there is no man flexible enough to adapt to all circumstances, either because he cannot deviate from what nature inclines him to, or because he cannot resign himself to abandoning a path that has always been prosperous for him. The prudent man fails every time he needs to be impetuous, because if he changed his behaviour with the circumstances, his fortune would not change at the same time. Pope Julius II acted impetuously in all his actions, and circumstances presented themselves so well with his way of acting that he always succeeded. Consider his first venture against Bologna, while John Vitifith was still alive. The Venetians watched him suspiciously, and the King of Spain deliberated with the King of France on the measures to be taken. But Julius II, driven by his ardour and impetuosity, launched the expedition by leading the troops himself. Such action left Spain and the Venetians in suspense, the former out of fear, and the latter, in the hope of reconquering the entire kingdom of Naples, neither moved. On the other hand, the King of France aligned himself with him, seeing that Julius II had launched the campaign, and wanting to gain his friendship to humiliate the Venetians, he judged that he could not refuse his troops without openly offending him. Thus, Julius II, with his impetuous attack, accomplished what no pontiff could have achieved with all human prudence, because if he had waited to have all precautions taken and all details finalized before leaving Rome, as any other pontiff would have done, he would never have triumphed for the King of France would have had a thousand excuses, and the others would have threatened a thousand reprisals. I prefer to pass over his other actions, all similar to that one, and all rewarded with success, because the brevity of his life did not allow him to experience the opposite, which might have occurred from circumstances where it would have been necessary to behave prudently, which would have led him to his ruin, for he would never have deviated from that way of acting to which his nature inclined him. It is therefore concluded that, since fortune varies and men persist in acting in the same way, they will be happy as long as they go along with fate and unhappy when they are in conflict with it. However, I consider it preferable to be impetuous rather than prudent, because fortune is a woman, and it is necessary if one wants to keep her subdued to strike and beat her, and it is evident that she submits to those who act forcefully rather than to those who act gently and as a woman she is a friend to young men because they are less cautious and more passionate, and they assert themselves with more boldness. Having reflected on all of the above, I wondered whether in Italy today the circumstances are favourable for a new prince to acquire glory. This is necessary for a prudent and virtuous man to establish a new form of government whereby, by honouring himself, he would bring happiness to the Italians and I cannot refrain from answering that there were so many favourable circumstances for a new prince in Italy that it would be difficult to find a more opportune moment, and if, as I have said, it was necessary for Moses to display his virtues, that the people of Israel should be enslaved in Egypt, for Cyrus to know his greatness, that the Persians should be oppressed by the Medes, and for Theseus to know his excellence, that the Athenians, 
should be dispersed, similarly, to know the virtue of an Italian spirit, it was necessary that Italy should be pushed to the extreme, as it is today, and that it should be more enslaved than the Hebrews, more oppressed than the Persians, and more disorganized than the Athenians, that it should be devoid of a leader and laws, that it should be punished, stripped, mocked and invaded, and that it should endure all kinds of humiliations. And although until now one has noticed in this man, or in that one a brilliance of genius, to the point of believing that he had been sent by God to redeem these lands, it quickly appeared that fortune abandoned him at the height of his career, so that Italy waits almost lifeless for a liberator, one who must heal her wounds, put an end to the plundering of Lombardy and the extortions of the kingdom and Tuscany, and heal her wounds, which have been gangrenous for so long. Thus one sees her praying to God to send someone who will deliver her from this cruelty, from the insolence of the barbarians, ready and willing to follow a standard as long as there is someone to wield it. And today there is no one in whom one can have more confidence than in your illustrious house to become the leader of this redemption, with your favoured fortune and virtue from God and the Church, of which you are now the Prince. And this will not seem difficult to you if you keep in mind the lives and actions of the princes mentioned, and although these were rare and marvellous men, they were none the less men, and none had a more favourable opportunity than this, for their enterprises were no more just or easier than this, and God has not been more lenient to them than he is to you, for he is great in justice. And here there is a favourable disposition, and where there is a favourable disposition there can be no great difficulties. All that is lacking is for your house to draw inspiration from the examples of the men I have cited as models. Furthermore, extraordinary and unprecedented events executed by divine will are observed here. The waters of the sea have parted, a cloud has shown you the way, water has sprung from the stone, and manna has fallen. All of this contributes to your greatness. The rest is up to you. God does not want to do everything to avoid taking away our free will or the share of glory that is rightfully ours. It is not surprising that none of the Italians I have mentioned have been able to do what is expected of your illustrious house. Nor is it strange that after so many revolutions and military uprisings, the military valour of our compatriots seems extinguished. But this is because the old military organisation was not good and no one knew how to change it. Nothing honours a man who has just come into power more than new laws and new institutions that he has conceived, for if they are well founded and contain something great within them, they make him worthy of respect and admiration. And Italy lacks not for clay to mould, and if there is a lack of value in the leaders, there is too much among the soldiers. Just look at the duels and brawls and notice how superior Italians are in strength, skill and cunning. But in battles, and exclusively because of the weakness of the leaders, their role is not brilliant, for the competent are not obeyed, and everyone else is believed incapable. But so far no one has known how to impose himself by his valour and fortune, and make others yield. To this must be attributed the fact that in the many wars of the last twenty years, Italian armies have always failed, as evidenced by Taro, Alexandria, Capua, Genoa, Bologna and Mestre. If your illustrious house wishes to equal these eminent men who liberated their countries, it is necessary above all, and as an indispensable preparation for any enterprise to surround, oneself with one's own arms, for there can be no soldiers more faithful, more sincere, and better than one's own, and if each of them is good, together they will be better when they see that the one who leads them, honours them and treats them paternally. Therefore it is necessary to organize these troops to defend themselves with Italian valor against foreigners, although the Swiss and Spanish infantry have a reputation for being formidable. Both suffer from defects, so a third order could not only contain them but also defeat them, because the Spaniards do not resist cavalry and the Swiss are afraid of infantry that shows as much perseverance as they do on the battlefield. That is why it has been seen and will be seen again that the Spaniards cannot withstand French cavalry and the Swiss collapse in front of Spanish infantry. Even if we have no definitive proof of the latter, we can get an idea from what happened in the Battle of Ravenna, where Spanish infantry faced German battalions that follow the same tactics as the Swiss. The agile Spaniards, aided by their shields, penetrated between the German pikes and stabbed them without risk and without defence on their part. If the cavalry had not intervened, 
there would not have been a German alive. Therefore, knowing the shortcomings of each of these infantry units, it is possible to create a third one that resists cavalry and is not intimidated by infantry, which can be achieved with new weapons and a new arrangement of fighters. It must not be forgotten that these are the things that give authority and glory to a new prince. Therefore, one must not let this opportunity pass so that Italy, after so much time, finally sees its Redeemer. I cannot express with what love, what thirst for vengeance, what obstinacy, what stubborn faith, what tenderness, what tears he would be received in all the provinces that have suffered the flood of foreigners. What doors would be closed to him? What peoples would refuse him obedience? What envy would be aroused against him? What Italian would refuse him homage? All reject this domination of the barbarians. So, let your illustrious family embrace this cause with the ardour and hope with which one embraces just causes, so that under your banner the homeland is ennobled and under your auspices the aspiration of Petrarch is fulfilled. Virtue will take up arms against oppression. The battle will be brief because the ancient courage in Italian hearts is not yet dead.